Amen. Thank you so much, Mary. It's one of my favorite songs. Welcome once again, friends, to this very important presentation from our Landmarks of Prophecy series. I want to welcome those who are watching or you're watching the video stream from around the world. And um, it's very exciting uh, and a privilege to be able to open God's Word with you. Tonight's presentation is a very important one and it can be a very difficult one. Uh, not just maybe for me to present in the right spirit, make it clear, but to receive and to hear. And so I pray that we'll all be praying in our hearts that uh, as it says in Revelation, the Lord will give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now we're going to begin as we do with our, our title for our lesson tonight is called The Daughter's Deadly Dance. And it's based on a story you'll find in several Gospels, in particular, Mark chapter 6, verse 17 through 29. It's about John the Baptist and how he met his end. Uh, king Herod, who was the son of the king who tried to kill Jesus as a baby, he believed John the Baptist was a prophet. But uh, what happened was Herod ended up basically stealing his brother Philip's wife. Her name was Herodias. Philip had the territory to the north of Galilee and Herod had the area of Galilee and the surrounding region down to Jerusalem. And uh, John the Baptist had the audacity to call that adultery. Well, this is the king. And now his uh, wife that he took from his brother, he was a wealthier king. She was more attracted to uh, be with a younger brother. Um, John the Baptist began to say that that was a sin and it was adultery and he did it publicly because he's calling the whole nation to repent and he thinks the king needs to be a better example. Well that really infuriated Herodias. She pushed um, her husband to have John in prison. You find that mentioned in Luke 3 verse 19 and 20. But Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for all the evils which Herod had done shut John up in prison. But he just left the mayor in prison. He was afraid to do anything to him because not only he knew the people loved and respected John, but he believed that uh, the power that John had, that he might be a prophet of God, and it doesn't go well if you kill prophets. And so he was sparing John. Well, Herodias hatched what she thought was a foolproof plan. Herod's birthday was coming up, and she planned a big party and invited everybody in his realm to come. And after he had had a few drinks, um, he used to like to watch her daughter, young Salome, come out and dance. And she came out and she did this provocative, seductive dance. And as she had expected, I guess he was in the habit of making uh, kind of bombastic promises. He said, you, what do you want? Up to half my kingdom, and it's yours. He was showing how generous he was in front of the other party guests. Up to half my kingdom, anything you want, it's yours. She didn't know what to ask for. She went to her mother and said, what should I ask for? She didn't ask for a gift card to Nordstrom's or something like that, or Macy's. Her mother said, you want right away the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king, when he heard that, he was very sad. And, uh, but there were all the guests, and you know, a king, when he makes a promise, he needs to keep his word. And so after this counsel from the mother, Herod had to keep his promise. An executioner was sent to the prison and with no fanfare or formality, the prophet was killed there in prison alone. And his disciples came and retrieved his body. So what I want you to especially notice here is that during the period of Christ's ministry, Jesus had begun his ministry, there was a mother-daughter team that persecuted the prophets of God. Not only did Herod do this to John the Baptist, but later Herod was involved in trying Jesus himself. You know, the Bible tells us there was another Old Testament team. That's our first question in our lesson. Number one, what other mother and daughter team persecuted God's people in the Old Testament? You read your answer, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 13. That infamous queen of the northern kingdom, her name was Jezebel. When you hear the name Jezebel, does that conjure up good images in your mind or is it usually somebody that's evil? 
Not too many people named their daughter Jezebel. Not too many people named their sons Nero. It's kind of what you save for your dog, <laughs> right? It was a person who went down in biblical history in infamy because she was guilty of killing the prophets of God. And she tried to kill Elijah several times, killed many other prophets. Now the thing I want you to notice about Jezebel, she had a daughter whose name was Athaliah. And here you have Jezebel who lived during another three and a half year period. Now I want you to notice this number because this number appears in the book of Daniel, you may not know it appears in the book of Esther. This number appears in the book of Revelation, and it appears during the life and ministry of Jesus. That number is 1,260 days. Alias, 42 months. Jewish month, 30 days. 42 months, 1,260 days. Or a time, a times, and the dividing of time. A time in Hebrew was a complete circle of the seasons or one year. A times meant a couple or a pair of years. So you got a time, that's one, and a couple, that's two and a half. Can't do that with my fingers. Three and a half, right? So that number must be very important to God because He says that number every way you can think of saying that number. During that 1,260 day period, there was a famine during the time of Elijah. It's mentioned also in the book of James. Then you have 1,260 days during Jesus' life when he preaches during the time of persecution. John the Baptist persecuted. You've got Herodias and her daughter persecuting the prophets. You've got Jezebel and her daughter persecuting the prophets. And then Revelation says there is a prophetic 1,260 years where Babylon and her daughters persecute the prophets. All of it starts coming together when you, uh, you take that in. All right, let's do ne ne question number two. Then we're going to read something out of the Bible. Number two. We've, this is the third time we've mentioned this, but we're going to really uh, drill down into it tonight. What is the second angel's message of Revelation 14? You read in Revelation 14, 8, and there followed another angel saying, what is it? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. It's a she, Babylon, fallen. Why does it say fallen, fallen? Because Babylon fell in the Old Testament during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. God's people were free to come out of Babylon and go back to the promised land. This is now spiritual Babylon falling in New Testament times. You get two falls happening here. Again, God's people will now be free to come back to the promised land. All right, question number three. How does God symbolize Babylon in Revelation 17? We're going to prepare to read this. Revelation 17, verse 18. And the woman that you saw is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. So let me go ahead and uh, go to your Bibles. I want to go with you to Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to read this together. won't read it all, but... Uh, First few verses anyway. Now, you know, we've taken time. We've read Revelation 12, 13, half of 14. Now we're going to 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, these are the vials of wrath that are being poured out, he came and he talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth, or governments, have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away. This is strong language. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast, though your sins be as... He's talking about sin here. Woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. We'll find out what blasphemy is. That's also in Daniel having seven heads, how many heads? Seven. seven heads and ten horns. Very similar to the beast that we find in Revelation 12. And the woman is a rage. She's wearing purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her head, on her forehead, a name written. Interesting how many 
have names written in their forehead in Revelation. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which have the seven heads and ten horns. He goes on then and he gives the interpretation. But uh, I want to jump to that verse we just read a moment ago. Go to um, verse 18, last verse in this chapter. And the woman who you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now when John was writing Revelation, what city was reigning over the kings of the earth? Rome. And Rome is the one who imprisoned him. That was the empire back then. And what does a woman represent in prophecy? A church. So here you have a woman, a what? Church in Rome with great power. Now, I want to be as gentle as I can as I, as I share this. You want me to tell you what the Bible says, right? Um, you, you weren't very enthusiastic with that response. <laughs> I already shared with you that I think the first beast in Revelation chapter 12, and what I'm sharing with you is not new. This is actually very old, but most people have lost it with all the modern evangelical preaching that you hear these days. Some of it good, some of it is just foam, cotton candy stuff. But you don't hear these great prophetic Protestant truths anymore. But the first beast in Revelation chapter 12 was symbolic of a beast as a nation or a power, the Roman Catholic Church. Second beast is talking about North America and Protestants. Here you have Babylon now in chapter 17, same power, and her daughters, same power. Talking about the the daughters are the churches that have come out of Catholicism when there was this great divide. But they still bear resemblance to the mother in some of the theology. That's just a quick overview of that. Oh, yeah, I'll share that with you in a minute. That's, I got to let you digest that before I give you too much more. All right, so there's a list of criteria that are given here that tell us about who this woman is. For one thing, we read, and I'm going to go through just A on through the letters here. It says she's guilty of what? Verse 3? Blasphemy. This is review. We gave you several cases and quotes uh, that are in an earlier lesson of the claims that are made by the Roman Catholic power about their divine prerogatives. Here's just another one. The Pope is of so great a dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. And a biblical definition for blasphemy would be to claim the prerogatives or the personage of God. It's called blasphemy. Putting yourself in the place of God. What's a sin that cannot be forgiven? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying uh, there's going to be popes, no doubt, in heaven. I'm not saying that uh, there, uh, once a person claims this, they can't be forgiven because it's not just blasphemy. God doesn't say blasphemy can't be forgiven. He says blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. There's a difference, right? I'd tell something about the attire here. Answer B. What is she wearing? She is dressed in purple and scarlet. And I don't know if you've seen a, uh, a Vatican con enclave or conclave, uh, but the uh, bishops are wearing scarlet and the cardinals are wearing, uh, or the cardinals wear scarlet and the bishops wear uh, purple. I might have got that backwards. But those, well, let me get it straight. I got it in my notes here. At official functions, they are told what they're supposed to wear. Yeah, scarlet for the cardinals and uh, bishops uh, wear purple is the official colors. Uh, that uh, fits that definition. What else does it go on to say? What is the woman wearing? Gold, pearls, precious stones. Uh, are you aware that the, um, the Roman Catholic Church is by far the wealthiest religious institution in the world? And it ranks right up there with the wealthiest corporations in the world with its annual budget. In real estate alone, are you aware in most of the major cities in the world they have prime real estate because one of the first things that would happen, especially in South America, first thing that would happen, a town would grow around the church was the center of town. There would be a big plaza. And everything from St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City to St. Peter's Basilica in the middle of Rome and you go around the world just in property. How many people do you know that own multiple pieces of art by Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci? 
Not to mention, I, I don't know if it's still true, a few years ago they were the largest holder of silver in the world and many other priceless treasures. And so it is a very wealthy organization in spite of the terrible wrath of lawsuits that have come against them in recent years because of uh, some of the improprieties that uh, we know happen. Answer C, she's called the mother. Now, you may not know, but the Pope is actually the pastor of a particular congregation, not just the whole church at large, but in Rome, they've got the Lateran Church. That is the Pope's official congregation, church there. And you can see the inscriptions in Latin here on the uh, marble in front of that church. This is what it says in translation. The sacred Lateran mother and the head of all churches of the city and the world, meaning city of Rome and the world. And so frequently they use the title that they are the mother church and they freely admit that the Protestants that came out of the Catholic Church are strange children that need to come back. I don't know if some of you saw, I, I did a, um, a, a video that turned into a YouTube a few months back where uh, Pope Francis made a very heartfelt appeal to Protestants. It was played at a uh, Kenneth Copeland Evangelical Conference. Any of you see that video? It's got like 600,000, or over a million views actually, because it's on a few different sites. Um, and it's a very direct appeal that these wandering children come back, that we embrace again. And, and it, so well done, made me have second thoughts. I thought, wow, that's such a nice appeal. And then I look at the Bible and I say, wait a second now, there's theology problems here. It won't work. B, or answer D, <clears throat> it says, she, ha she has harlot daughters who also are fallen. Now, I probably ought to say this quickly just so that nobody uh, misunderstands. I am not picking these words. God picks these words. Do you know, not only does God say that there are Protestant and Catholic churches that fill the role of harlot, he says his people in the Old Testament, he called them a harlot. So don't think that we're trying to be derogatory. This is the language God uses both for Israel in the Old Testament. You ever read the book of Hosea? He compares his church to a harlot. Why? Because he says, I married you and you are going after other lovers by worshiping other gods. They got his people in the Old Testament got involved in idolatry and they got involved in worshiping other gods and mingling the worship of Baal with the worship of God. That's why Elijah said, how long do you halt between two opinions? Because the, his people were, they were, you know, like being an unfaithful wife. They kept going out with the other um, pagan religions around them. God said, do not let your children marry their children. He called it adultery. He called it harlotry. So the language in Revelation 17, I know it's strong, but it's the same language he used for his people in the Old Testament. So is that clear? He said, I'm not trying to be hard on any Protestant. I'm a Protestant technically or Catholic. I'm just saying whenever God's people stray from the Word of God, he calls it harlotry. So, children typically look like their parents. There's going to be some similarities between one parent or another. And uh, in the same way, if you have daughters, there are going to be similarities between the daughters and the mother. And so you're going to find that there are certain relics of the Roman religion that many Protestants took with them when they separated because they did not completely separate. They still held to some things that had no biblical foundation. It says this power, talking about Revelation 17 still, that she persecuted and martyred the saints. So this was a persecuting power. And, you know, friends, from the time that 538, when the Pope really received an army and political power, until 1798, conservative estimates say 30 million to 50 million people died directly as a result of the church and its persecutions because they sent armies into, you've heard of the Crusades, you've heard of the Inquisition, and this is not something, again, I'm not trying to be hard, I'm just interpreting prophecy. This is what the Bible says, guilty of the blood of the saints. Did God's people in the Old Testament kill prophets? What did Jesus say? Woe unto you, Jerusalem, who kill the prophets that are sent unto you. So again, they were his people, but they were doing terrible things. This has also happened historically, not just before Christ with the Jews, it's happened after Christ with the Christians. And genuine Christians had to flee into the wilderness that same period of time, 
1,260 days while you've got that mother-daughter team that is persecuting the prophets. It says she, the woman went into the wilderness and God fed her there. When Elijah went into the wilderness, now I'm jumping back to Revelation 12, when Elijah went into the wilderness during that 1,260 days, did God miraculously feed him? When the children of Israel came out of Egypt and went into the wilderness, did God feed them? When Jesus fasted for 40 days, at the end of the 40 days, did God feed him? You know, it says angels ministered unto him after the devil left him. If you've been fasting 40 days, how do you think the angels ministered to him? Gave him food, just like the angels gave Elijah food after he had been in the wilderness. And so now you have God's people going into the wilderness and God feeds her with what? The bread of life. Some of you have heard of the Waldenses and the Hussites and the Albigenses. These were whole nations and people that had to flee into remote places in the Italian Alps and other regions because their religion, biblical religion, was outlawed. They would copy out the Bible by hand they taught it to their chi children. Their children had entire books of the Bible memorized so that the people would not lose it. They would go into the villages and share the Word of God and um, started a revival. But it was a persecuting power. Matter of fact, here's a quote from uh, the history of the popes. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and their children, stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. And so this is what happened during that time. One more uh, feature that we read in Revelation 17 to know who is this woman? Scarlet, purple, precious stones. It says she sits on what? Seven mountains. You look up seven hills. Guess what's going to come up when you Google that? Rome is the city of seven hills. And this is just right out of an online dictionary here. Rome founded in 753 B.C. by, of course, the brothers Romulus and Remus on seven hills, a term used for centuries to describe the and it goes on and it names those seven hills. I always struggle with their Italian pronunciations. Seven hills of Rome. She sits among what? Seven hills, the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth, scarlet and purple, not done yet. It's hard to miss what this group is, what this power is. Answer G, it says she ruled over the kings of the earth. Now, there I, th I just captured a picture from this last year, I believe, where Pope Francis, after making a trip to the Holy Land, knowing that the Palestinians and the Israelites were having such troubles. I think it was in the news again today that there was an attack in a synagogue. Did you hear that? It's been going on a long time. He invited the presidents of Palestine and Israel to come to Rome to talk about peace and they came and to pray together and they came. The Pope will meet with the United Nations. It was announced since the seminar began. He's making his first trip to Philadelphia, the United States, next year. How many of you have heard that? To discuss the family. And I understand he's going to meet with Congress during that time. He's received an invitation um, to meet with both a joint house of Congress and the Senate. That's a lot of power for a religious leader. Uh, they usually don't have Billy Graham address the United Nations. You see, we have an ambassador in America to the Vatican. Why would we have an ambassador, ambassador to a church? Unless it's more than a church. The Bible says it's a political power. That's why the term beast is used. Beasts were used to describe kingdoms and powers like this. This is just recent. This is not like it used to have during the Dark Ages. The kingdoms of Europe couldn't do anything without the approval of the Pope. There were bishops in every kingdom. Henry VIII was the first one to really break away. I told you I'd tell you the rest of the story. You know, he was applying for another marriage to be annulled, one of his many wives. And uh, after several wives, the church says, you know, even we can't, I mean, it starts looking back, bad, Henry. We can't just keep giving you divorces. You've you got a problem, and you need to deal with it. And so Henry VIII sent uh, an ambassador to meet with the Vatican to appeal one last time to receive his approved divorce. And the ambassador brought his large dog with him. It was like a, some kind of big Afghan dog. And the Pope put out his foot to be kissed by the ambassador. The dog, misunderstanding the gesture, bit the Pope's foot. The Swiss guard then killed the dog on the spot, which so hurt and outraged the ambassador that he turned on his heels and withdrew. 
And the rest is history. Now you have the Anglican Church because they said we are breaking away from the Catholic Church and uh, it just caused an, uh, an irreconcilable difference at that point. <laughs> but that's just a little a bit of trivia. But the, they had leadership over the monarchs of Europe, the kings of the earth. Now, let me just, I want to reiterate, this is not something that Pastor Doug or my church happens to have conjured up. What we're sharing with you was the belief of history for hundreds of years. I'm going to give you a few quotes, and I hope you check on me. I hope you'll study and find out what was the original belief regarding the great reformers about what is represented by Revelation 17. Okay, here is a quote from Martin Luther. Of course, you know what he believes. Based on the prophetic studies of Martin Luther, uh, he finally declared, we are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and the real Antichrist. I can give you a hundred quotes by Luther alone. John Calvin, Presbyterian. Of course, Martin Luther, Lutheran, I guess. John Calvin, Presbyterian. Some persons think of us as too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that if they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt, Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. That's taken from his book, Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is a classic. John Knox, Presbyterian, that great Scottish reformer, says John Knox sought to counteract what he called the tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church. See, he's not talking about any particular Pope. He says ages. It's the office we're talking about. Pope Francis might be a wonderful man. As with Luther, he finally concluded that the papacy was the very Antichrist, the son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. Roger Williams, are you an American? One of the founders, he's the one who established separation of church and state for the United States. Baptist pastor, he said, um, the pretended vicar of Christ on earth who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over all the souls and consciences of all his vassals, yea, over the spirit of Christ and over heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. The Westminster Confession. You know how many churches adopt the Westminster Confession? It used to be about 50% of the churches thought that that was a, a valid confession that virtually all Christians could buy into. Here's what's said there. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Cotton Mather, a congregational theologian. The oracles of God foretold the rising of an Antichrist in the Christian church. And in the Pope of Rome, all the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered that if anyone reads the scriptures and doesn't see it, there is a marvelous blindness upon them. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church. Speaking of the papacy, he wrote, he is, in an empirical sense, the man of sin, as he increases in all manner of sin above measure. He is too properly styled the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his oppressors and followers, he is that exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, claiming the highest power and the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. And here's from the book Great Cloud of Witnesses. Wycliffe, you ever heard of the Wycliffe translators? You wouldn't have an English Bible if it wasn't for Wycliffe. Tyndale, you've heard of the Tyndale Bible translators. You wouldn't have an English Bible if it wasn't for Tyndale. Luther, Calvin, Kramer, John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, um, Jonathan Edwards, the American reformer, Charles Spurgeon, Bishop Riley, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, these among many others all saw the office of the papacy as Antichrist. That's from the book All Roads Lead to Rome. And I cut, honestly, I cut a number of the references out because this has already been tedious. But how often do you hear that these days? It's not popular, it's certainly not politically correct. The question is, is it biblical? Why do you think so many of these prophecies have been distorted and aren't being shared? Um, makes you wonder, but this is what God tells us is going to create a confederacy in the last days. Number five, 
How do the beasts of Revelation 13, you remember Revelation 13 is where you find the mark of the beast. How do the beasts of Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 that we just read compare? Let's look at Revelation 13. Verse 1, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast up, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Now you jump to Revelation 17, verse 3. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And so if I were to tell you, well, you'll never believe what I saw on my way to the meeting tonight. Scarlet colored dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And you say, oh, that's no big deal. I see those all the time. They've got crossing signs all around New Mexico. Watch. I mean, how often do you see something like that? Isn't this the same creature? Do we all agree it's the same one? What's the difference between Revelation 13 and Revelation 17? And in Revelation 12, you get this scarlet dragon trying to devour the man-child. There's a woman sitting on it. So you've got the power of the Roman Empire. They started to lose their power about 400 A.D. When Constantine moved the empire to Constantinople, I'm sorry, Justinian moved it to Constantinople, gave an army to the Pope, said, you are now the bishop of the Christian church, you are the head of the Christian church so that he could maintain control over it. Now the woman, a church, is sitting where the Roman power used to be. When someone sits on a horse, who is supposed to be in control? Any of you ever ridden a horse where you were not in control? <laughs> I used to break Bronx that we adopted from uh, Arizona. Wow. But um, you're supposed to be in control. That's what that means. All right. And then you have again Revelation 12, verse 3. Again, you get this dragon. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. We learn what the seven heads represent. The seven hills of what city? Rome. You all still with me? Are we still friends? Are you my enemy because I tell you the truth? That's what Paul said. Number six. What is the meaning and the origin of the word Babylon? Genesis, and you find this in Genesis chapter 11. It says in Genesis 11, 4, 6, 7, 9, you remember they said, let's build a city and a tower whose top might reach to the heavens. And the Lord said, let us go down and there confound or confuse their languages that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore, the name of that, it's called Babel because there the Lord did confound or confuse the language of all the earth. Why do we call babies babies? Because they babble. And that's where you get the word babbling from. At the Tower of Babel, when they couldn't understand each other, they started to, what appeared to be barbaric babbling to each other. And uh, don't miss this point. It's going to come up later in our lesson tonight. At the Tower of Babel, when there was a confusion of tongues, they were building this tower to ostensibly save themselves in case God flooded the earth again make a name for themselves. They're probably going to have an altar at the top and do it connected with worship. And God confounded their languages. There was a confusion of tongues, right? Is a confusion of tongues a good thing? Does the Bible say that God is not the author of confusion? You read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. God said, if you're going to speak in another language in church, make sure you have a translator and do it in order because God is not the author of confusion. Let him who speaks... Speak five words with your understanding that you might instruct others than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. Paul said, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, I'm still in 1 Corinthians 14, how shall you prepare yourself for the battle? So, if you're going to speak, speak words that are easy to un be understood. Better to prophesy than speak in tongues. Because by prophesy, you're being edified. There's just scripture after scripture. And yet, do you see now a lot of Protestant churches and charismatic Catholic churches where people are babbling in an unbiblical way in churches where they don't know what they're saying and no one else knows what they're saying and there's no interpretation going on. And I, I don't want to be critical, but that's, I believe in the gifts of tongues. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. That's a lot of babbling that's coming to some of the churches and it's different from what they did on Pentecost. And Pentecost, what you had was the Lord gave the disciples the ability to speak in the languages of these visiting Jews from all over the Roman Empire for the purpose of giving understanding. It says, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They knew what they were saying. 
That's why they were converted. That's why they repented. They could understand. There was, that's the blessing of God, understanding. Curse of God, confusion, not understanding. Does that make sense? But that's sweeping the churches as well today. Number seven, how does God describe Babylon in urging his people to leave? Revelation 18, verse 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And he goes on to say, And has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit. And then he goes on to say, Come out, do what? From the screen. Come out of her, what's a woman? My people, that you, why? That you be not partakers of her sins, and here's the part I don't want you to miss, and receive of her plagues. God is calling people out of Babylon before the seven last plagues in Revelation fall. That's serious. Now, let me just give you a Bible story that helps illustrate why this is important. <clears throat> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three great patriarchs, came out of Mesopotamia, that's where Babylon is. They brought their wives out of Babylon into Canaan, the promised land. God said, I'm going to give you this land. When it came time for Abraham to find a wife for Isaac, he said to his chief servant, Eliezer, do not let my son marry one of these local pagan gals. I know that we're in the promised land. We're still surrounded by pagans, but he is to marry a girl that worships Jehovah. Go back to Mesopotamia. Get a wife for Isaac. Her name was Rebecca. Bring her out. And you know the story. She watered the camels, and it was a miracle story about how God answered a prayer, and she's chosen to be the mother of Israel, so to speak. Quite literally, mother of Israel. Because uh, she gave birth to Jacob, who later was called Israel. Comes out of Mesopotamia into the Promised Land. Time for Jacob to get married. Rebecca says to Isaac, It's breaking my heart that Esau has married these pagan girls. That's, my life will mean nothing, she said to Isaac. If he marries one of these local girls, he's got to marry a girl that believes in Jehovah. He goes back to Mesopotamia, gets a wife, Jacob gets four wives actually, they're on sale, and he brought them all back <laughs> to, uh, not exactly how it happened, but brought them back to the promised land. Then you have the children of Israel are carried off to Babylon during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, there's no people like the Jews. They are the most, if you don't believe the Bible for any other reason, the Jew should be a reason for you to believe the Bible. Because there are no other people in the world that have been conquered and dispossessed from their land three different times and come back to their land and still have their language and their culture. I mean, it's, that's a miracle. I don't know how people can deny that. And they've got the book that's changing the world. They were carried off to, went off to Egypt, came back, went off to Babylon, came back, dispersed by the Romans and came back again in 1948. Wow! That's amazing how this country is surrounded by all these enemies that would love to annihilate them still is such a major force in the world, smaller than California. And anyway, so they're in Babylon, but they're not there just for a little while. They're there for 70 years. Now, how comfortable would you be? I've been here about four weeks, and man, I'm, I'm set now. I mean, I got everything. You know how it is when you go on a camp out and you bring enough for the millennium, right? So they've been there 70 years. They've got friends, they've got jobs, they've got their roots down, their fruit trees are producing, they've seen grandmas and grandpas pass away and buried in this country. Then all of a sudden God says, Babylon fell, Persians conquered them. God says, come out of Babylon back to the promised land. They said, oh, wait a second. Yeah, I know we came from the promised land, but we got roots here. We're established. We have family, we have jobs. God said, I am going to visit plagues on this country, and if you stay you will be part of the plagues. Come out. They had to endure great hardship to tear themselves away from their familiar, they spoke the language, from their familiar language and go back to the promised land. And it's a struggle for people today. But you read the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, they had incredible courage. They came back to a land where the cities were all broken down and they started from scratch and they said, why? Because this is the land God gave us, this is where we're supposed to be. And they came back, started all over again. Bad things happened in Babylon to those that stayed behind. God says, come out of her, my people. Jesus said, many sheep I have that are not of this fold. 
But them also I must call, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. When Jesus comes back, how many folds? One. Why? Because his people are going to come out of Babylon. God has dear people in many different churches. And the ro Lord raised up this movement that's bringing you this seminar because we are calling people back to the scriptures for the last days to prepare for the return of Christ. We're seeing the final events happen all around us. This is the message of prophecy. Come out of her that you receive not of her plagues and you're not responsible for her sins. A lot of dear people don't know. But when we know and we choose to stay in Babylon, that's different. When you know, sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. Come out of her, my people. Number eight. Jesus repeatedly indicates, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus repeatedly indicts Babylon for making the world drunk with her wine. What is this wine? You know, it's interesting that uh, if you read back in Revelation 17, it talks about the woman has what in her hand? A golden cup. That's, that's interesting. Having a golden cup in her hand. If you look in the Catholic Encyclopedia, it'll tell you the chalice, speaking of the golden chalice that's held by the, the Pope and often by priests, is the most important of the sacred vessels because there they put the wine and it is fermented wine that's supposed to represent the blood of Jesus. Let me park on that for a minute. If you're a Christian, you know about the Lord's Supper. Jesus in the Bible is extremely explicit that the bread that is to represent the body of Christ, his sinless life, is to be unleavened bread because it represents the sinless life of Christ. That blood is to be unfermented grape juice. Jesus said at the Lord's Supper, drink ye all of this. He passed out the grape juice and he said, I will not drink it until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. The word wine is used interchangeably in the Bible for both grape juice and the fermented stuff. They didn't have the word grape juice. It was all called wine because it came from the vine. And Jesus used unfermented grape juice at the Lord's Supper. And so the idea that um, Jesus would want everyone to get drunk, putting something that, you know what, uh, you know what the number one most deadly drug in the world is? Alcohol, by far. Alcohol kills more people every year, breaks up more families, causes more car accidents than cocaine and marijuana and crack and LSD and heroin, all the others combined. So how much should a Christian support that? Should we be passing that around and calling it the blood of Christ when, when it turns into a drug? Unleavened bread, unfermented grape juice. But what does Revelation say? She has made all nations drunk. Now, it's not just the issue of it being alcoholic. You, know, I, I, you can tell I have a problem with that. Um, it's also because that represents the doctrines. The blood represents the theology of Babylon, which goes into both Protestant and Catholic churches. There's a lot of unbiblical things that have divided the churches. We need to come back on what the Word says. Let's give an example of what some of the specific doctrines of Babylon would be. Start with something simple I hope you won't argue with, that the Ten Commandments are not binding, that you really don't need to worry about keeping the Ten Commandments. They're just recommendations. Are they good ideas? They're ten suggestions. Is that, if you're in a church that's teaching you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments, I would classify that as a doctrine of devils. Because sin is the transgression of God's law. That's what the Bible says. If a church is telling you it's okay to break one of God's commandments, whether it's the Sabbath or bowing down to idols, the Bible calls it a sin. And the job of a good pastor is to tell you what sin is. Pastor's job is to make those who are comfortable uncomfortable and make those who are uncomfortable comfort them. <laughs> you got to do a little bit of both. So if you're in a church that's saying you don't have to keep the law, and I've seen people say, oh, we're not under the law. Well, what Paul means by that is we're not under the penalty of the law because of Jesus. He doesn't mean we're not under the obligation to obey. Paul says, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He's not saying that. Paul said it's not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. It's Romans 2.13. Connected with that would be Sunday sacredness, calling the day holy that God didn't make holy. I picked this picture in particular because if you ever go to Rome and, and a lot of the churches, there's a reason Sunday is called Sunday. It's not S-O-N, it's S-U-N. It's connected with sun worship. And like that, right under the cross, you'll see a solar disk. 
all throughout Catholicism and a number of the Christian churches, they, you got soldiers. Why do you think all the Bible characters had halos? Does it ever say anything in the Bible about, hey, he had a halo around his head? But they all, those were solar disks that used to be behind the heads of all of the pagan paintings and deities. And it's not in the Bible. It's connected with ancient sun worship. We talked about the second coming of Jesus. Did we make it clear that the second coming of Jesus is going to be the loudest, most vivacious? It's going to appeal to all of your senses. And so the idea that he's coming secretly, do you know where that teaching came from? A Jesuit doctor named Francisco Ribera wrote that hundreds of years ago after the Reformation, after Protestants began to look at Revelation and point to the church, they went flowing out of the church. So the Catholic Church had one of their Jesuit doctors write what they call uh, the futuristic interpretation of prophecy that was eventually adopted by a man named Schofield who has the Schofield Bible that made it popular for Hal Lindsey, wrote the book The Late Great Planet Earth, and it has become the theology about the second coming that sort of spread with the left behind books all through Christianity but it's not what the Christians believed for 1900 years they believed in a literal visible loud climatic coming of Jesus at the end of a great tribulation not before the tribulation and we get Bible questions uh, frequently during our radio program and we've had people call in and say Pastor Ross, Pastor Doug we're looking for scriptures to explain the secret rapture. We can't find them. Can you help us? And we say, no, we can't help you. <laughs> what? So they're not in there. Everything about the second coming says he's a loud roar, a trumpet, an earthquake, a shout, a resurrection. It, it's the heavens are dissolved. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. True. What happens that day? The heavens dissolve with fervent heat. The earth and the things that are in it are burned up. The elements melt. Does it sound like life goes on seven more years when Jesus comes like a thief? No, but the Babylonian teaching, the immortality of the soul, the idea that you're going to live forever in hell or live forever in heaven, God said you sin and you will die. Penalty for sin is death. The devil said you won't really die. That's what he said to Eve, remember? Who are we going to believe? The immortality is a gift. The Bible says God and God only has immortality. And yet the Christian church, or, and many sincere people, even pastors are sincere, they don't know. And then the idea of eternal torment that people right now are burning in hell before the resurrection, before the judgment, and that they're going to burn for zillions of years. Pick the biggest number. I guess Google was supposed to be a big number. I don't know what it is. A Google is a number with a whole bunch of zeros. But take, take a gazillion and then realize that if you've got a person blistering and burning for a gazillion years, some 15-year-old kid that died lost, churches teach they're going to burn forever, and after a zillion years go by, they have not even begun yet. Can you think about what e eternal burning is really like? What does that do to the character of God? For the sins of a fraction of a fraction of a second, they're going to burn forever. The Bible says there is a lake of fire, there is a hell. Don't misunderstand. I tell my Baptist friends, my hell is hotter than your hell. Your hell just burns forever. Mine burns them up, right? <laughs> That's what it says. The wicked will be burned up. So if you're in a church that's teaching this that came out of Greek mythology, you may be in Babylon. Distorts the character of God. You're in a church that says that you're supposed to call your religious leader a father, and Jesus said, call no man father. You have one father, which is in heaven, or confess your sins to them, confess your sins to God, confess your faults to one another. A man does not have the power. The only sins I can forgive for you are the ones you commit against me and you for me. But when it comes to our sinning against God, a man can't forgive that. And then we've discussed all the different counterfeit methods of baptism that uh, are not found in the Bible. These are serious issues, friends. These are some of the very popular divisive doctrines that uh, are out there. Answer H, there's a confusion of tongues that are in a lot of the churches. And uh, I believe again in the gift of tongues. I'll tell you some night, I believe I received the gift of tongues in a miraculous way. I picked up a Mexican hitchhiker, I guess this is the night I'm telling you, in Demi, New Mexico, right here in this state, driving to California. He didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Spanish. I had just prayed and said, Lord, I'm just driving along by myself, a two-day two drive, this old truck. I said, it'd be nice to have someone to talk to. I didn't even have a radio that worked. It was a 1954 Chevy truck. I saw this man on the highway. I picked him up. He got in. I realized he didn't speak any English. I said, oh, Lord, you got a sense of humor. I mean, you know, my, 
Spanish was ordering at Taco Bell. I mean, I didn't speak any Spanish. And as we rode along, I was just praying. I found out that he didn't figure it out somehow he's looking for work. And, and by the time I got to California, I was talking to him. I, I shared with him. He came to live with us, ended up getting baptized. You're probably not surprised because I preach to everybody. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I was speaking Spanish. And today, I still remember a good part of my Spanish from that. And that's the gift of tongues, where the Lord gives you the ability to speak another language you didn't formally know or study. I studied it, but I flunked in school for the purpose of spreading the gospel. It's not the stuff we're seeing in a lot of churches where people are babbling, they don't know what they're saying. And I'll talk, ask me a question about that. Number nine, what power will support the beast in the end time? Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12. I beheld, now we're in Revelation 13, 11, another beast coming up out of what? The earth. That first beast came up out of the sea, multitudes of people, great civilization, all roads lead to Rome. But now we've got a new great nation that rises, a nation that would somehow figure prominently into the Christian faith. It became a stronghold for primitive Christianity. The Puritans and the early Christians came to this country looking for freedom to worship. But it starts out with two horns like a lamb. That's Christ, good thing. But before it's over, it speaks like a dragon. Keep in mind, prophecy in a few words will cover hundreds of years. Our country is compared to Rome, still a young country. But we're getting to the part where we're getting ready to speak like a dragon. It says here, the waters, the angel said, represent a multitude of people. Then what would dry earth represent? A comparatively unpopulated area is where this uh, creature comes from. It's going to appear after that 1798 date. You know, even though 1776 is when we had our declaration, we weren't recognized by the other countries of Europe until 1798 as an independent country because we were in the middle of a revolutionary war. They didn't know who was going to win. By 1798, they said, yep, yeah, sure enough, they're an independent country. And it became the stronghold for Protestant Christianity. But things are changing. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. Starts doing what that other beast did, making the same mistakes, unfaithfulness. And causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. That means this second beast has to be a strong enough power to be able to tell the rest of the world what to do. Now I know that uh, we've got the Chinese and some of the other countries are nipping at our heels as a world power, but when it comes to military spending, America outpasses China. And we are still the superpower in the world when it comes to our technology and our military power, though we don't use it sometimes. You know, a few years ago, some of you remember what brought down communism? The Time Magazine came out that had a blockbuster story about how Ronald Reagan, Pope John Paul II, conspired together to bring about the demise of communism. You go to Poland, you can even see where they've got a statue of Ronald Reagan walking and talking with Pope John Paul II. They recognized they worked through solidarity, uh, the Polish unions there, to help bring down communism in Europe. And um, it's interesting that when Pope John Paul II died, how often do you see three living American presidents kneeling before a dead pope? That was really an epic picture, I'll tell you. And I told you, I think it was even curious that when you look at the architecture between Rome and the Vatican, and the, you get the Washington Monument, you get the obelisk in front of the Vatican, there's so many similar... The days of our week that we use in our country, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Roman. The calendar, we don't use an Inca calendar. We don't use a Mayan or even a Jewish calendar. We use a Roman calendar. Why do we have a month called July? Julius Caesar. Why do we have a month called August? Augustus Caesar. You know why February is short? Because Augustus Caesar didn't want July to be longer than August. He took days off February. It, that's right. The Roman influence, the Senate, our government, is all based on that Greco-Roman foundation. Makes an image to the beast, begins to follow, and then starting to tell people to worship. According to the prophecy, oops, I did what they told me not to do. I pressed the button that reset the whole thing. All right, a little help back there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 
They gave me too many buttons. <laughs> Number 10, according to the prophecy, what drastic change will take place in America? And this is where it gets interesting. Revelation 13, verse 11 and 14, starts out like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. Artists have found it very interesting that uh, the bison, one of the largest of all cattle, only found in North America, great big, has little bitty horns like a, <laughs> a ram. How does a nation speak? A nation speaks with what it legislates through its laws, the, the rules that it makes its people obey. Another little amazing fact I thought you might find interesting, and this was brought up by Christianity Today magazine, that with um, the approval of Judge Kagan, who recently joined the Supreme Court for the first time in the history of our country, when our country was founded, it used to be, believe it or not, right or wrong, I'm just telling you the fact, used to be all of the Supreme Court justices were Protestants. Did you know that? Now there is not a single Protestant on the bench. There are three Jewish, they all align with a certain faith, three align with the Jewish faith, the remainders are all Roman Catholic. That's the first time. I thought that was interesting. There's been a shift. You know, America was, they, we, America founded looking for religious freedom, fleeing from what they thought was the tyranny in Europe, but we may end up following in the same steps according to the Bible. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that had the wound by the sword. The word of God is what wounded the beast, the sword. But it came back to life. Deadly wound was healed. Number 11. What three powers will unite against God's people in the end time? Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. You notice God has the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The devil's got his trinity too. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are going to be working together to deceive. Where's a frog's power? Has he ever been bitten by a frog? Or is his frog's power in his tongue? Isn't that right? How does a frog catch something? It's his tongue. You've never been kicked by a frog. Not very hard. Its, it's weapon is its tongue. And it's going to be through false spirits speaking things. False messages. Number 12. Will these diverse organizations ever effectively unite? Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the whole earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, better known as the battle of Armageddon. These are the things that are just before us. We've got another study. Someone asked me, what is the battle of Armageddon? Number 13. What effective methods will this end time coalition use? And this is why we need to know our Bibles because the devil said he's going to use signs and wonders. Jesus said if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Revelation 16, 14, they are the spirits of devils doing what? There will be real miracles. Even in our cynical society today that's so scientific, when they see miracles, they're going to be blown away. It won't be special effects. Revelation 13 and 14, he does great wonders, not any wonder, great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he does what? He deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles that he had power to do. You cannot believe what you see with your eyes. You need to go by the word of God. That will be our only safety, friends. Number 14. What will prevent God's end time people from being deceived? What's going to be our only safety? You can read about it in Isaiah 8.20. To the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in him. This is talking about the Bible, God's word. We need to be able to say why we believe what we believe. Now again, I want to reemphasize, God has got loving, Christian, spirit-filled people in many different denominations, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox. I believe that. I keep saying it because I want to make sure you know that. I've got friends in many of these churches. I'm friends with many of the leaders in these churches. We study together and sometimes respectfully disagree. But I want to be able to give a Bible answer. Jesus is going to come. I've got to go by what his word says. This is the rock that's going to stand. Paul said, I'm sorry, um, Peter said, we need to be ready always to give an answer to anyone that asks the reason for what we believe. Friends, do you know why you believe what you believe? Are you in Babylon? You know, it's going to be a real struggle for some people to come out. 
We've got friends that may be connected with systems of religion that we've been for years and God is sending us truth because he says the plagues are going to fall on Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Jesus is calling his sheep to come together as we near the end of time. There's going to be a shaking in his world, in this world. And you can't wait until the last day before you make your decision. It's like the people that were watching Noah build the ark. They said, yeah, you know, Noah's right. It's a wicked world. And when it starts to rain, I'm going to get on board. But by the time it started to rain, the door had shut. You cannot wait until the last minute. Jesus said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. He's wanting us to have the courage to say, Lord, I'm going to go to the promised land. I am ready to leave Babylon. It's not just coming out of something. It's coming into something. God has his people, and he wants you to be part of his people. That's going to be this last day movement that is giving the three angel messages to the world. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. There's no neutral ground. And I wonder if before we close with prayer, if you'd like to just say, Lord, I want to be with Jesus. I want to be in his ark. I want to be in his fold in the last days. Is that your prayer, friends? That's your desire? Why don't we ask him together now? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we've uh, discussed and studied a difficult subject today. Help us to have the courage to make the decisions, to follow your word. We believe Jesus has brought us to hear and to see these things. And I pray, Lord, you'll also give us your spirit to take our stand, to stand up when others are bowing down and say, it's the truth, and we're going to follow the truth in your word, knowing the truth will set us free. We thank you, we bless you, and we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless you all. Don't miss tomorrow night's program. It's called Babylon's Buffet. Learn how to live longer and feel better from prophecy.